And welcome to Students for Liberty's e-leadership series. My name is Peter Niger and I'm the Internal Operations Manager for Students for Liberty. We're honored today to have Richard Ebling deliver a talk tonight on the issue on the lessons of Soviet socialism for our own time. Before we begin though, I'd like to take a moment to introduce you all to SFL and the e-leadership program if you're unfamiliar with us. Students for Liberty is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's run by students and for students who are dedicated to liberty. We were formed about three years ago to serve a previously unfilled niche at our universities by connecting liberty-friendly students with other students, faculty, organizations, and resources to help them advance their ideas on campus. Just a few of the resources we offer include free books for student groups and a large speakers network, protest grants, handbooks on running a student organization, tabling kits, and training, and of course, our conferences. We're going to be holding over nine conferences across the country this fall, and then our international conference will be in Washington, D.C. next February. Now, the e-leadership program is our way of giving you access to the ideas and mentorship in Liberty year-round from wherever you are. We hold webinars each week to put you in touch with the top mentors and scholars of Liberty. For a full list of what we have scheduled, please visit our website at studentsforliberty.org. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker for the evening. Richard Ebling is a professor of economics at Northwood University. He was formerly the president of the Foundation for Economic Education, was a Lud Ludwig von Mises professor of economics at Hillsdale College, and served as Vice President of Academic Affairs at the Future of Freedom Foundation. He, he received his bachelor's degree in economics from California State University, Sacramento, and his master's in economics from Rutgers University. Professor Ebling has also been a lecturer in economics at the National University of Ireland at Cork and an assistant professor of economics at the University of Dallas. Um, Dr. Ebling has been published and has had articles published in many different forums, including the Freeman, Reason, Libertarian Review, Critical Review, Political Studies, Advances in Austrian Economics, the Austrian Economics Newsletter, International Journal of World Peace, American Journal of Economics and Sociology, and numerous other publications. And his articles have been published in Brazil, England, Austria, Poland, Lithuania, Hungary, and Russia. Now just a quick note, there will be about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the webinar. Feel free to type in any questions you have into the question box. And for those who are interested, this webinar will be recorded and archived on our website. We'll have that up in the next week or so. We'll be sending you more detailed information about inter internships and the liberty movement in our follow-up. Now, without further ado, I present to you Professor Evelyn. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be uh, participating in this webinar this evening. Um, I want to set the stage for what I will talk about by reminding uh, all of you that it's just 20 years ago that in August of 1991, uh, there was an attempted hardline coup attempt in what was still then the Soviet Union. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was then the uh, Ger General Secretary of the Soviet Communist Party, had been introducing various types of reforms, uh, transitions towards uh, less re restrict control and central planning. And the hardliners in the Communist Party were concerned that this path was going to lead to the demise of the Soviet system and the ideal and, and, and uh, institutional structure uh, of uh, communist authority uh, in the Soviet Union. As a consequence, in August of 1991, they attempted a coup attempt. Uh, in the middle of August, they kidnapped Mikhail Gorbachev, who was away in his summer dacha on the Black Sea. They attempted to kidnap and kill Boris Yeltsin, who was then serving as president of the Russian Federation in the Soviet Union. They failed in that attempt. Yeltsin succeeded in eluding them, making it to the heart of Moscow at what was then the Russian Parliament building, and soon was rallying the people of Moscow to come to the support and the defense of the budding democratic movement in the Soviet Union and in Russia itself. I was fortunate to find myself in Moscow at that time. Uh, for about a year and a half, I had been doing consulting work on market reform and privatization mostly with what was emerging as a democratic movement in the Soviet Republic of Lithuania, which was desiring to once again regain the freedom that it had lost as a result of the Hitler-Stalin pact to divide up Eastern Europe in 1939. But they were also interested in moving their economy away from socialism to a market-based economy. And I was also traveling to Moscow frequently to consult with the Moscow city government on such reforms. And I found myself in Moscow there and in fact my future wife, who is from Moscow, uh, with the defenders of democracy, uh, with Boris Yeltsin 
at that uh, Russian parliament building. And for three days, we stood facing Soviet military tanks, KGB units, as they uh, were jostling the crowd and threatening to open fire. And in, in fact, some young people in their late teens, early 20s, were actually killed at that time. But through a peculiar se sequence of events, the coup luckily failed after three days. And the day after the coup failed, there was a huge rally for freedom and democracy in a large plaza that is behind that Russian parliament building. And it was really filled with an ocean of Moscovites. And they were uh, cheered on and given short talks by many of the defenders of freedom uh, at that time in Russia. Uh, Boris Yeltsin himself, Elena Bonner, the widow of the well-known Soviet dissident and Nobel laureate Andrei Sakharov, and a variety of other noted Russian Democrats. But at one point, the crowd looked up to the top of the building of the Russian parliament building. As they watched the Soviet flag, the red flag with the yellow hammer and sickle in the upper left-hand corner, come down off the flagpole. And in its place went up the uh, traditional old Russian colors, which are also red, white, and blue. And suddenly there emerged from that ocean of Russians, in unison, a chant, Svoboda, 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 freedom, freedom, freedom. After having lived under communism for almost 75 years, that ocean of Russians was now hoping, aspiring to the idea that they could be what they called us in the West, a normal society, a society in which you did not have to worry about the secret police coming in the middle of the night, knocking on your door and taking away you or a loved one, and perhaps never seeing them again or even hearing what their fate was. To escape from a system that controlled every thought, everything they read, everything that they saw, that manipulated every aspect of the society, that dictated where they lived, what, how they worked, what their standard of living would be, and in fact treated them as nothing more than as a cog in the wheel of the Soviet central plan. That is what they wanted to escape from. That's what they were hoping to not have as their future, since that is all that they had lived through in their own lifetimes of their past. Now, if any of you follow the international news, you know that since 1991 and up to today, Russia, now in its post-communist period, has followed an extremely rocky road. They've had their ups and downs. The system is still very authoritarian. It's extremely corrupt. You need to have connections. You need to have the right support in ministries. You know who to give the bribe to. And the government basically monopolizes power under the hands of uh, the prime minister and the president and basically prevents any uh, dissident or, or opposition parties from gaining a toehold in the public. But having said that and recognizing that I'm sure that for many Russians, the last 20 years have had significant frustrations and disappointments, and I'll even say cruelties. The fact remains that as imperfect as that current post-Soviet Russian system is, it is far better. It is like the other side of the moon from the epoch of communism that they lived under. Does the secret police exist? Is there cri bribery and corruption? Are there political connections? Are there privileges? Yes but it is not the totalitarian state under which they had lived. How did this all come about? How did it work? What were its consequences for the citizens? And what lessons should we learn from it now in the 21st century after having experienced it in the 20th? It came to power in Russia as a perverse outcome of the First World War. The First World War, as again many of you probably know, broke out in 1914 between, on the one hand, Imperial Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Bulgaria, and the R Turkish Empire on the one side, and then Britain, France, Imperial Russia, in 1915 Italy, and then in 1917 the United States. Now, out of all of these belligerents, the weakest link was Russia itself. It was only beginning to industrialize. It had a very poor infrastructure. And it had an absolute ruler in the autocrat of, autocrat of, the, of the Tsar. The war was unwinnable for the Russians. 
the economy collapsed. The soldiers were disillusioned and had become cynical. They were at the front line facing the Germans in the winter of 1916 and in the spring and winter months of early 1917. And what they were facing was no food, no new boat, boots, no clothes to cover themselves in the heavy winter. And at home in the cities, there were demonstrations because there wasn't bread. As a consequence, the pressure finally came on upon the Tsar, Tsar Nicholas II, to have to abdicate in March of 1917. And in this place arose a provisional government of democratic but moderately left of center political parties that had formed. And they ruled from March of 1917 until November of 1917. But they made one fundamental error, and that is they did not accept the fact that Russia could not win and continue to participate in the war against Germany. They continued to fight, feeling a sense of loyalty to their Western allies, but the military situation deteriorated. The food supplies became scarcer. The disillusionment grew and grew. And in this setting, a small, almost infinitesimal group of radical revolutionaries had their chance to take advantage of the situation. And that was the left-wing uh, segment or fra faction of the Russian Social Democratic Party, the Bolsheviks, as they were known, led by a Russian who was in exile, Vladimir Lenin. But following the abdication of the Tsar and the democratic opening in Russia with his departure, Lenin, who was in exile in Switzerland, made a deal with the Germans, the enemies at war with Russia, that if they would transport him across German-occupied Europe, get him into Russia, he would do all in his power to change the policies of the government and get Russia out of the war so the Germans would only face the British and French and then the Americans on the West and not the Russians on the East as well. And after a circuitous and long route, he arrived in St. Petersburg, the then capital of Russia, which in the wartime was known as Petrograd. And in a short period of time, he rallied his radical communist or Bolshevik forces, and they actually attempted a coup in July of 1917, but they failed in that. In fact, Lenin had to go into exile in neighboring Finland, but he came back in secret in the autumn of 1917. He re-rallied his supporters. He persuaded them to attempt a coup once more. And on that fatal evening and early morning of November 7th, 1917, Lenin's Bolshevik seized all of the buildings and organs of power in the capital of St. Petersburg, Petrograd. And this short episode window of democracy in Russia ended. Now, the appeal of democracy was strong. And even Lenin could not uh, abolish or prevent an election for a constitutional assembly that had been promised in December of 1917. And in fact, that Constitutional Assembly election was held. The problem was is that the people voted. And when they voted, Lenin's Bolsheviks had less than a quarter of the seats in the Constitutional Assembly. The Assembly met for one day in early of January 1918. When, they, when the other delegates, the uh, three quarters of the delegates, refused the demands of Lenin's faction, Lenin called in his armed guards, his red guards, ordered that the session be closed and the deputies be thrown out. And that was Russia's one day of elected representative democratic decision making abolished by Lenin. And no more democracy in Russia again for almost 75 years. Now what followed shortly after, beginning in the spring of 1918, was the emergence of a civil war. The Bolsheviks on the one hand, and a wide variety of somewhat collaborating and often operating independently anti-communist armies. They were called the White Armies. And at one point, in fact, in, 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 in the summer of 1918 and even in, in part of 1919, the Bolsheviks had basically been pushed into a small little bit of territory stretching from St. Petersburg to Moscow to a bit of Central European Russia. But the rest of Russia was occupied by the white armies. But the white armies were not coordinated. 
and most of the people were disillusioned with them for the simple fact that what they promised was to overthrow the Bolsheviks and return to some form of monarchy. And that the nobility, the aristocracy, with its privileges and favors would be brought back. And given that the Bolsheviks ended up being more brutal and more cruel and more, and more willing to kill than even the white armies, the tide of battle turned. And by 1920 and certainly the early part of 1921, for all intents and purposes, the white armies were de defeated and the Bolsheviks were triumphant. And Lenin had come to power. Now, Lenin ruled till 1924. He'd had a heart attack in 1922, or, excuse me, a stroke. But he died in 1924, and a new leadership arose. The most cruel, the most brutal, the most manipulative, the most intriguing, in my opinion, other than Adolf Hitler, the most evil individual of the 20th, 20th century, Joseph Stalin. Stalin consolidated his power. And by the late 1920s, 1928, he assumed absolute power as leader of the Soviet Communist Party through an intriguing of, of playing faction against faction in the central committee meetings of the Communist Party. He then ended all remnants of the remainder of private enterprise in Russia. No small businesses, no private agriculture. Everything was now, over the next several years, fully nationalized. All land was collectivized. Central planning was imposed. The ideal now of five-year plans. And with it came an immense brutality. It is estimated, for example, that in the attempt, the successful attempt, to collectivize the land between 1930 and 1933, that between 9 and 12 million peasants were killed because of their resistance, their opposition to having their land taken away from them and forced to live in these collective farms. They were shot on the spot. They were exiled to Soviet Central Asia or to the vast reaches of what was emerging as the slave labor camps in Siberia. Or they, their villages and their towns, their agricultural regions, especially in South Central Russia and Ukraine, were surrounded by Soviet army troops or KGB, that is secret police units, who would prevent any attempts to either leave the regions or anyone outside of them to enter. And they went into these regions and they confiscated every bit of food, every last piece of grain of, 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 of wheat, and left these people to starve into submission. Indeed, people who saw this said they went into villages and all they found were practically skeleton-like people walking around with swollen bellies glazed eyes, and in some villages the evilness of this had reached the point that parents were eating their children that had passed away already. And sometimes not to have the trauma of eating your own child, you would trade children with a neighbor whose child had also died, so you did not eat your own son or daughter. But the resistance of the peasants were broken and communism was triumph, triumphant in the countryside of agricultural Russia. This continued throughout the 1930s. Stalin instituted purges of every conceivable group in academia, in the military, among intellectuals, among various industrial sectors and groups of workers, anyone who he thought in any way, shape, or fashion, in his mind, some have said paranoid mind, was seen as a potential or an existing threat to his rule and the triumphant achievement of socialism and central planning. In 1937, 1938, when the purges were at their height, he sent specific instructions to the interrogators of the secret police to use any form of physical force necessary to get people under interrogation to confess. And when he was told that these methods were working, he wrote back in a document that is in the Soviet archives. Beat them, beat them again and again until they come crawling on their stomachs with their confessions between their teeth. It reached a point where thousands of people were being killed in Moscow alone in 1937 and 1938. 
tortured, shot at various locations that the secret police was using as their, as their imprisonment camps and then their torture chambers in Moscow. What would they do with the bodies? Well, David Remnick, who was a reporter for the New York Times during Gorbachev's period in the 1980s, went around with some Russian historians who were get, allowed to get some access to the Soviet archives about what went on and the truth of the detail of it. And he was taken to the Donskoy Monastery in Moscow by these Russian historians. And he was shown where the bodies would be brought in in army crates that you would like use for rifles. And all the paperwork would be done to keep a record of who had been killed. And the bodies would then be thrown into ovens to be burned. Remnick explained that the Russian historian said that the record showed that as the smoke went out of the chimneys, the ash of the burnt humans would fall upon the surrounding buildings or on the snow-covered ground. They also would bury them in a neighboring cemetery. But there were so many to bury that they didn't successfully cover them all completely. So as a consequence, starving dogs would come into the cemetery, cemetery in Moscow. And people would find the dogs walking through the cemetery or in the surrounding streets with arms and legs in their mouths. The howling would go on all night. The stench would result in people in the neighboring buildings hanging out their windows vomiting all night from the smell. That was the reality of the Soviet Union under Stalin. It is estimated that between 1917 and 1986-87, Gorbachev's time, that in one form or another, worked to death, starved to death, tortured to death, as many as 64 to 68 million people were killed in the name of building the Soviet Socialist Utopia. These are not the deaths in World War II in armed combat between Soviet and German soldiers. That was more millions. We're talking about unarmed men, women, and children whose fate were sealed because for one reason or another, they were stamped enemies of the state. 64, 68 million people, that's a number that is so large that how do you even conceive of that? But just remember that every one of those 64 to 68 million people was a man or a woman, a mother or a father, a son or a daughter, an aunt or an uncle, an individual, a human being, many your age, who had hopes and dreams, desires, wishes, wanting a future, and it was destroyed destroyed through being tortured and shot, destroyed by being starved to death, destroyed by being worked to death in labor camps in the Arctic regions of the Soviet Union, or even at the, during and after the first, Second World War, when Stalin was interested in developing his own atomic bomb project, that these slave laborers would be sent to the furthest reaches of eastern Siberia where there were uranium mines and they would be sent to work deep into the mines digging out the uranium and rapidly developing radiation sickness and dying off in that cruel and painful way. But no matter, there's always more to round up, more to send off to the camps, more to send to their deaths to serve Stalin's purpose. That was the reality of his system. No court of appeal, no chamber of a higher authority. There was no one but Stalin. How did he view this? Well, in the 1930s, while these mass murders and executions were going on, a member of the British aristocracy, a Miss Lady Astor, who was left-winging, leaning in her politics at home, came to the Soviet Union on a visit. And she got an audience with Stalin. And she asked Stalin point blank, how long he was going to go on killing people. And after the translator explained her question to Stalin, Stalin calmly answered without any hesitation, for as long as it is necessary to eradicate the enemies of socialism 
so we can build our new beautiful future. And Stalin himself, this mass murderer of millions, this destroyer of the lives of millions, well, he died in his sleep, having had a stroke in March of 1953. But there's an irony even there, if I may say. And what is that irony? Well, he was found lying on the floor in his country estate outside Moscow. And they called physicians. But the problem is there were no physicians to call. Why? Because over the last the previous three years, from 1948 to 1952, Stalin had been instigating and beginning a final purge. And what was this purge? It was to undermine what he labeled the doctor's plot. Supposedly Jewish Russian doctors loyal to either the capitalist Western America or to the, the Jewish state in Israel, these rootless cosmopolitans were threatening to poison and kill Soviet leaders right there on the operating table. And so he had rounded up dozens of these people accused of part of this Jewish plot to undermine and kill the leadership of the Soviet party. Some were in prison, some had already been killed. And in fact, if Stalin had not died, he was planning the final, final solution of the European Jews. Because he was planning to hold mass executions of Russian Jews in Red Square. And he was planning to round up the approximately two million Jews that were living in European Soviet Russia and exile them all into the wastelands of Siberia to die. He was going to complete what Hitler had begun. But there he was lying on the floor, having suffered a stroke during the night, and there were no doctors to call. Why? Because his own personal physicians had been arrested and imprisoned and some killed at his own orders, so he died. Now, that did not end the circumstances and the cruelty of the system. Following him came Khrushchev, then Brezhnev, then a whole variety of others. But all of them shared a belief in the monopoly power of the Soviet state, the ideal of socialism in being triumphant around the world, a system of Soviet central planning, and the need to eradicate all opposition. In the 1980s, Kevin Close was the correspondent for the Washington Post in Moscow. He recounted that he had met a miner, a simple ordinary miner from the Ukraine, who had complained that the safety conditions in a Soviet coal mine were dangerous. How, what did he get for his uh, attempt to bring this danger to the attention of the Soviet Ministry of Mines, he was arrested. And he was declared to be a lunatic. Because to question the Soviet state was by definition a demonstration that one was mentally ill. Because how can one challenge the Soviet party that represents the concept of the achievement of destiny and history? And so he was put in a mental institution. And he was filled with excruciating drugs to control his mind and his body. And that type of treatment of ordinary human beings and ordinary citizens existed until the end. Now what else can we perhaps understand about the nature of the Soviet Union and things to understand? Well, I'm sure all of you have heard the rhetoric that the ideal of socialism, the goal of communism, was, an, was a society of equality, the ending of class distinctions, the establishment of everyone being equal, fairly treated. No, no aristocrats, no, no group of, of, of selected few having while many are without. The fact is the Soviet Union, beginning with Lenin and accelerating from Stalin on, was the most privileged region, class structured uh, 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 created society in the modern world. Your status, your position, your access to goods, to services, to housing, to medical care, to any of the necessities and amenities and conveniences of life were dependent upon where you fit 
into the Soviet hierarchy. If you were high in the party or high up in the bureaucracy in managing state enterprises, you had access to special food stores, special clothing, special medical clinics and treatment that the ordinary Russian did not. What the workers of Russia had was free medical care, free schooling, free virtually everything. But with that freeness came virtually nothing. Let's suppose that you found yourself in a Soviet hospital. Well, medical care is basically free, national health care. But there was no motive and incentives for the physicians and the nurses and the orderlies to do anything. They're just state employees getting their state pay. It doesn't matter the quality, the care, the service given. As long as they don't do something egregiously absurd and, 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 and embarrassing, their jobs are not threatened. So perhaps you've come in for treatment, you've had an operation, and you're too weak to get out of bed, and you need to have a call of nature, and you need a bedpan. Well, you better have a few rubles to bribe the nurse or the orderly to bring the bedpan. Uh, you, you finish your, your, your call of nature, you better have a few more ru rubles for the a, a nurse or the orderly to take away the bedpan. If you're ill, well, medicine is free, but that doesn't mean that they'll have the antibiotics. You will have to then go onto the black market and acquire the drugs, the pharmaceuticals that, that you need. For example, as I mentioned, my wife is Russian. When we were married, she had a daughter that was then 16 years old. She'd been married, my wife had been married before. And while, while I was back in the United States, she contacted me and told me that her daughter had come down with hepatitis and that there were no pharmaceuticals, uh, no, no drugs and that it was impossible even to buy in the black market. So I just went to a doctor that I knew. I was then a professor of economics at Hillsdale College, as was mentioned in the introduction. And I gave him the, the, the symptoms that a Russian doctor had given to my future wife. He made out a prescription. I went to Myers, a local supermarket, and had the prescription filled in 10 minutes and cost me $15. And luckily, I was traveling back to Moscow on one of these consulting trips three days later. And I had the pharmaceuticals to fight the hepatitis that might very well have saved my wife's, wife's daughter's life. Healthcare was free, but you had very little for your freedom. Let's suppose that uh, you're concerned about uh, birth control. Well, the difficulty in the Soviet Union is that the central planners did not assign much significance to both birth control devices. So the most frequent form of birth control were abortions. Indeed, the average Soviet woman had anywhere uh, between four to ten abortions in her life. Now, surely whether you're pro-abortion or anti-abortion, no one would consider that the preferred method of handling an unwanted uh, child. Now, you go in for an abortion. Now imagine having such a very serious and intimate uh, medical treatment and no anesthetics. And in fact, that was very common for many operations, even women who were giving birth and were having complications, no anesthetics. Yes, it was free, but it was only available for the privileged few in the party in the higher reaches of the bureaucracy. Let's suppose you want to go shopping everyday shopping. We here in the United States, we take it for granted. We go into the supermarket, we take our cart, we start going down the aisles, we pick this off that shelf, this something else off another, we pass by the fruit and vegetable section, we, we grab the meat and the fish out of those counters, we get our things in the dairy section and so on and so on. And then we go to the checkout counter and we're even irritated if there's three people in front of us in the line and we have a five or a ten minute wait. Well, what was shopping in the workers' paradise of the Soviet Union? Well, under central planning, and remember, everything was planned by the government, everything was produced by the government, everybody was employed by the government, everybody was housed and determined where they would live in terms of apartments in the entire country by the government, and the government also allocated and distributed all that the central plan produced in government-run stores. There were no private stores. 
And in the wisdom of the central planners, their idea of rational production and supplying of consumption goods was to have distinct and separate stores for every conceivable product. So if I may do it in this fashion, suppose, comrade, you wish to buy bread. You know what you do, comrade? You go into people's bread store. What you do in people's bread store? Wait online and wait. And what you do online when you get to front of line, you tell person behind counter what loaves of bread you want. Pumpernickel, wheat bread, rye bread. Assuming, comrade, they have any bread. But having told the woman behind the counter what she wants, she gives you a slip listing the types and the number of loaves of bread you want. You then go to a second line. And what do you do on that line, comrade? Ah, you wait and you wait and you wait. And you get to front of line, comrade. And what do you do at front of line? Pay woman at counter for the items that the other woman gave you on piece of paper. And now you have receipt that you paid for the, for the bread. What you do now, comrade? Go on third line. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And you get to front of line, turn in the receipt, and now you finally may get the bread if there's still any left behind the counter that you paid for. Now, as the phrase goes, man does not live by bread alone. Now you want some bread, some cheese. Uh, besides the bread, you want cheese, milk, for example. Ah, now you have to go to the dairy store. And this dairy store is not necessarily next door to the bread store. You may have to walk several blocks carrying the bread that you bought in, 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 in sacks or bags. And now you get to the dairy store. And guess what you do, comrade? You get on first line to tell the person behind counter what bread, what milk, what butter you want. Get on second line where you pay. And then get on third line to pick up items. Again, assuming there's any butter and milk left. Uh, but now you have butter, milk, and bread. How about some meat? Uh, have to go to a separate meat store. And now you wait on line again and again and again. That is how the average Soviet citizen throughout the Soviet Union, from Moscow, from Leningrad, from Kiev in Europe, to Vladivostok, far on the Pacific coast in eastern Siberia. That's how everyone lived, how everyone shopped. And there was no alternative to this. My wife would say that the problem was is that you have to go shopping on all these lines and the problem was is that the stores closed at 5 o'clock. So how the hell do you do your shopping if by the time you're let off work at 5 o'clock, the stores are closed? So what you do, you'd arrive at your place of work, you'd punch in, and then you would sneak out a window, usually a window if there was one in one of the, the, the restrooms. And you would then do your shopping. And you'd go to store to store and then come back and sneak through the window of the restroom, perhaps the toilet, and then you'd have your groceries and then you'd get to work with whatever part of the day was left of it. And as was commonly said, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. That is how people got by. What were the human relationships like in this situation? Well, we in the West have friends and in our friendships with people, we are closer to some and others are acquaintances. But we usually make our friendships because of common values, common beliefs, common interests, common attractions. Now, there certainly were those human relationships in the Soviet Union. Indeed, they were close and binding. Why were they close and binding? Because you had to be fearful of anything that you said. Because anything that you may have said that was dangerous, a criticism, a problem that you saw in the system that you complained about, Anything you said could be reported to the authorities, and you could lose your job, you could be arrested, you could disappear. So friendships were close because you really had to trust the other person. Your, your close friends with whom you could say everything and anything and not worry that they would share it that would result in severe harm to you. But precisely because the system was not open, competitive, but was dependent upon what the state provided and what you could get from the state. You had to have a second layer of friendships. 
Now, these friendships were not based upon similar interests, common values, uh, just close you know, connections and emotional uh, interactions with people. But this was the other layer of friendships because you needed connections. Do you know someone who knows someone who has an, an uncle or a cousin in a Soviet store that has access to something that you need or want? Now, that involved a degree of hypocrisy. Your, your concern, your interest that you took in this person may have developed into a real friendship, but it often began and remained one that was sort of a feigned friendship because you needed people to get by every day. When will there be a shipment of foreign shoes to a Soviet shoe store in Moscow, shipped from, let's say, the Czech Republic? And the Soviet Union was a strange situation where the Soviet colonies of Eastern Europe, the Soviet bloc countries, often lived better and had better manufactured goods than the colonial master economy in Russia itself. So, oh, shoes from Yugoslavia, jackets from East Germany, this was like heaven. And to know ahead of time that there was going to be a shipment so you could get online and wait your turn to hopefully get the jacket or the pair of shoes. My wife told me that one time she waited three days online for a pair of shoes for her daughter. Three days! With no certainty that when it was your turn at the beginning of the line, whether they would have the size that you were looking for. But no matter, buy any pair of shoes, even if it's the wrong size because it might be something that you can then sell to somebody else for something that you did want that they were willing to take and trade. That was the perversity, the corruption of the system. It was a system of class, power, privilege, manipulation, control, and created human hypocrisy. That is what the Soviet Union created. And the system didn't work. I'm watching our time and I, I know that the hour is, is, is passing by and we want to have some questions. But I would remiss, be remiss if I didn't also take at least a couple of three minutes to emphasize that besides the political brutality, the manipulation, the control, the terror, the mass murder, it could not work just as an economic system. And that had been explained theoretically even at the beginning of the Soviet experiment by the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises who in 1920 wrote an article called Economic Calculation in, this, in the Socialist Commonwealth, which he expanded into a full book, a treatise on socialism, which he published in 1922. There he showed definitively why, in principle, in the abstract, a socialist planned economy could not function. And why? Because it didn't have the method of determining what goods consumers wanted, the values they placed upon them, and what should be done with the scarce resources that have the ability to be used in many different productive ways. Should it be used to make product X? Should the scarce resources be used to make product Y? Should the scarce resources be used to make product Z? In the market economy, these problems are solved by the pricing system and private competitive markets. Where people can buy and sell legally, they have incentives to look for gains from trade. When there are potential gains from trade, people have incentives to higgle and haggle in the marketplace over buying this in exchange for that. And out of the higgling and haggling and negotiating of the marketplace emerge agreed upon terms of trade. And out of agreed upon terms of trade come the prices of the market. And these prices then enable us to know what is it that consumers want? What values do they place upon it in terms of the dollars they're willing to pay to get them? It tells us what the resources are worth, the land, the labor, the capital equipment, the various and diverse diverse types in their alternative competitive uses to make product X, to make product Y, to make product Z. Because businessmen, entrepreneurs, can bid in ex against each other. Don't work for him. Don't work for me. I'll pay you 50 cents more an hour. hour. Don't make a machine for him from those resources. Make a machine that I need in my business. I'll pay an extra $2,000. And prices emerge, therefore, for the factors of production as well as for the finished consumer goods into society. And these prices for output and the resources that are the inputs enable us to then calculate profit and loss to determine what is more profitable and less profitable. What co combination of resources will enable us to make the goods that consumers want in the least costly way so as not to waste them and use them for some purpose that is less valuable than another. And as Mises' colleague, 
and lifelong friend Friedrich Hayek complemented that analysis in later years, prices enable us to use the vast knowledge that is decentralized among all the minds of the society. Each of us knows some things that others don't. And we each have different types of knowledge that others do not possess. How do we take advantage of what others know and can use that knowledge to do for us in making goods, providing services, other than allowing the price mechanism to enable us to communicate with each other, converse, if you will, to tell each other what it is we want, at what prices we might be able to supply it, and then through those price signals of having the freedom of the marketplace to apply ourselves as our knowledge and circumstance suggest to us to most effectively and efficiently and productively do so for our own benefit, but through the pro exchange process reciprocally to serve others in society as well, guided by the prices that then tell us how best to apply the knowledge that is unique to ourselves in the vast and now global division of labor. That is what the socialist planned economy did not have. The state nationalized the means of production. They were the single producer of all finished goods and services. There was nothing legally to buy and sell. With nothing legally to buy and sell, there's no potential gains from trade. With no potential gains from trade, there's no higgling and haggling of the marketplace. With no higgling and haggling in the marketplace, there's no agreed upon terms of trade. With no agreed upon terms of trade, there's no prices. And with no prices, how can the central planners or anyone else know what it is that consumers really want and really value that they would like to buy for the needs and circumstances and conveniences of their own life? How do we know what those scarce resources are really worth in their alternative and competing uses so that labor more valuable for purpose X isn't misused for purpose Y? And applying to land and capital equipment and all other resources as well. By doing away with private property, the market, and prices, socialism did away with the necessary and inescapable institutions without which rational economic coordination and order cannot exist. Or as Mises later entitled a small book of his many decades later, socialism did not assure prosperity, plenty, plenty and utopia. What it gave the world where socialism was in place was planned chaos. That is why socialism failed. It was a system of corrupt, violent brutality, and it was an economic system that did not bring wealth and prosperity, but hardship, mismanagement, and poverty and despair. Now, we're here in the 21st century. It seems long ago. Many of you who were young and people in your teens or 20s, the Soviet Union and the Cold War are fairly something that, that is a, a vain, faint mystery, some, something that you maybe just have been told about in school that seems as out of date and far away as Napoleon in the beginning of the 19th century. But we need to remember these lessons, and we need to learn from these lessons, because wherever government grows, expands its tentacles of power, regulation, planning, restriction, so that less and less of our decisions are our own, and more are determined and dictated by government planners, government regulators, government interveners, the more we are not only under the thumb of the state, but they do away and prevent the market from functioning so that each of us can benefit from all the knowledge that others possess in the society, preventing prices and competition from doing the job to telling us what others want or what prices they could do things for us, and the competitive process, which Hayek also referred to as a discovery procedure, because it is through the competitive process of trying that we discover who can produce best, who can produce something new, who can produce something less expensively, who can solve the problems of satisfying our needs, wants, and desires better than the other fellow who is peacefully competing for our business and clientele in the marketplace of human voluntary interaction. Every step towards more government control is a step towards government domination and the preventing of the markets to do its wondrous achievement of enabling all of us to interact freely in a vast network of peaceful and voluntary relationships, yet coordinating all that we do so that the food is in the stores, the cars are in the showroom, the clothes are hanging in the rack in the department store. And it gives us freedom. 
freedom to choose and decide and not have a Lenin or a Stalin or any of those monsters of the 20th century controlling and dictating our lives and even sending us to die in the wasteland of some faraway region. Thank you very much. I would be delighted to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ebling. Thank you so much, Professor Ebling. We've actually got three questions lined up right now. The first one comes from Victoria Henderson, and she says that she she recently watched a video of you giving a lecture at Universidad Francisco American in Guatemala, and you spoke about finding documents from Mises' personal library in Moscow. Um, and within the documents, there are annotations in the margins suggesting that the Russians continue to refer to Mises' work well into the 1990s. Could you elaborate on why the Soviets seemed to take such an interest in Mises? You know, that, was a, that is an extremely interesting question. Uh, s some of the people listening on may, may not uh, know this, so let me uh, preface it. Uh, Ludwig von Mises had been a famous Austrian economist. Uh, he left Austria in 1934 to take an academic position in Switzerland, but had kept his apartment, or at least part of his apartment, in Vienna. So when the Nazis occupied Austria in March of 1938, uh, Mises, as an, a, a leading critic of all forms of collectivism, including Nazism, obviously, and also being Jewish, uh, the Gestapo came looking for him. They didn't find him because he was in Geneva, Switzerland, in neutral Switzerland, but they broke into uh, his apartment and they boxed away all of his papers, documents, correspondence, family uh, memorabilia, and so on. And uh, Mises believed that for the rest of his life that the Nazis had destroyed it. But in a strange irony or twist of fate, uh, these documents were actually uh, just captured by the Soviets, along with millions of pages of other looted documents from all over Europe that the Nazis had seized in countries that they ran overran. And all of these documents of millions of pages of material, uh, private papers, uh, uh, government archives from different European countries, and Mises's papers, uh, were, were finally housed in a secret archive in Moscow under the instructions of Stalin. And there, uh, all these papers sat, including Mises's papers, uh, until the 1990s. Uh, only the Soviet secret police and the Soviet foreign ministry had access to the archives. And so finally, uh, it's a long uh, story, I find it fascinating. Uh, my wife and I were able to gain access to this uh, in 1996, October of 1996. And, uh, you know, to the victor goes the spoils. The Russians wouldn't give up the originals. But we were able to make photocopies of virtually the entire collection of, uh, of about 10,000 pages of material. Uh, and so we're going through this material. And we discovered that uh, Soviet archive, archivists, besides arranging the material, had also uh, periodically went through them, uh, looking through correspondence, checking on things Mises had written, uh, getting information about people he had corresponded with. So obviously, uh, this was important to the Soviets, uh, both because they knew who Mises was as a prominent uh, critic of socialist central planning, an enemy of all forms of collectivism, very outspoken against Marxism, uh, and the fact that as a noted figure, uh, knowledge is power, and anything that they could use in his papers, either about him or others with whom he was connected, uh, could serve their various devious purposes uh, for one reason or another. But that's a, that's a fascinating aspect that they seem to periodically go through his papers to try to get some type of uh, you know information they were interested in. Okay, the next question comes from Richard, Richard Pardo. Being a command economy, how has North Korea survived so long, and will it follow the fate of the Soviet Union? Well, you have to understand is that uh, just because central planning as an economic system uh, is a disaster doesn't mean that a regime that is brutal and dictatorial enough can't stay in power. Uh, international organizations periodically get into North Korea, you know, humanitarian organizations. Uh, and all of them come out reporting that the vast majority of the people live a terrible subsistence levels of existence. There have been mass famines and, and, and deaths, starvations. Uh, while, while, while the capital of North Korea, Pyongyang, has been made into the sort of like, like you know, the showcase of, you know, socialism triumphant. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's like a science fiction uh, city. Uh, I have friends who have visited there. Some uh, uh, people listening may be familiar with a free market columnist named Doug Bandow. Uh, he's, a, he's an associate scholar with, with the Cato Institute. 
and he's made at least one, I think, two trips to North Korea over the last 10 or 15 years. And uh, he, he, he's written about it, but he told me that you go through it surrealistic, uh, uh, broad highways, boulevards with no cars, uh, people walking around like robots uh, because they have been instructed that foreigners in the capital, they must not communicate or in any way show uh, human associative interaction, because if they do, that'll be taken as a sign of disloyalty or suspicion of being a spy, and, 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 and they'll disappear or their family members will disappear. It's like a robot society. Uh, the system doesn't work, the planning doesn't succeed, but the brutality of the regime uh, has enabled them to stay in power. Uh, the, the fact is, is that force is a very intimidating method. Uh, j just, just look at what is happening in Syria right now. now Syria certainly is not as totalitarian as North Korea. But the fact is, the current Syrian regime, at least following the news, as I suppose many of you are, uh, seems to be willing to send soldiers and tanks into these cities where these demonstrations are, and kill dozens, and now cumulatively several hundreds of people. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the former leader of, uh, of Syria, uh, uh, Saad Sr., his son is now the dictator, uh, back in the 1970s or 80s, I forget, put down a, a, a rebellion against his rule in the Syrian town of Hama and killed 20,000 people. Well, you know, that got people's attention to keep their mouths shut and their heads down. So unfortunately, uh, as long as a dictator has that type of support and loyalty from his military force and his secret police, it can endure even though it is an economic disaster. Uh, the next question comes from Osmil Brito. Sorry if I destroyed that name. Uh, thanks, Professor Ebling. How is it possible to stop socialism once it's installed on, in power? In Venezuela and in other countries in Latin America, we are walking into radical socialism of the type of the USSR. Well, I agree with you. Uh, I see that with, uh, with, uh, with the governments in Venezuela, Bolivia, and so on. Uh, and, and it is a problem. Uh, the, the difficulty is, is that the regime, when it controls so much of the economy, controls the lifeblood of everything. But let me say this, uh, I am old enough to have lived a, a good part of my life in the shadow of the Cold War. And in spite of the fact that I became interested in these free market and libertarian and Austrian economic ideas when I was a teenager, uh, quite a while ago, uh, and understood as a budding economist reading Austrian economics like Mises and Hayek, why socialism uh, could not work, why it was economically uh, in, 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 unable uh, to deliver the goods. Uh, I must confess that, like most other people, uh, I thought that the Soviet Union could and would endure uh, indefinitely, that pure uh, political force and power uh, and the threat of arrests, the legacy of Lenin uh, and Stalin, uh, would result in an enduring for a lot longer than it did. Or that if it failed, if it collapsed, it would either have to come from a devastating nuclear war, which of course none of us would want, or from some terribly bloody internal civil war. Uh, now the fact is, is that uh, the Soviet Union uh, went out with a whimper and not a bang. Uh, I witnessed uh, the, the residues of the Soviet attempt to maintain their power. Uh, not just in Moscow in that coup in August of 1991, but I was in Vilnius, Lithuania in January of 1991, when the Soviets attempted to crack down on the Lithuanian democratic movement. And in one night, they killed 13 people, three of them crushed under the of tanks. I witnessed this. I was on the crowds with Lithuanian friends. Soviet bullets were actually whizzing by my head. Uh, but the fact was, is that the system imploded because it had lost all ideological and political philosophic legitimacy. Uh, it could not deliver the goods. And no one believed it any further. Yes, you went to Communist Party meetings that you had to attend, and you had to spout all this you know, Marxist and, 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 and collectivist rhetoric. But, but, the, but this was all sort of like rote. You had to do it because the higher up instructed you. But, but it, 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 was, it, was a, it, it was a dead system that imploded internally. Um, and so at the end of the day, the system is unsustainable. The difficulty is, is that it takes time for this implosion. And unfortunately, uh, people like Chavez in, in Venezuela, as we see in, in Cuba uh, with the Castro brothers, um, sometimes with external support, Cuba for many years obviously had foreign aid from the old Soviet Union, but even after that has been able to endure to a great extent. Um, it's sort of a great tragedy that countries too often have to go through and it's very difficult to exit from 
uh, without some type of economic disaster or political cataclysm uh, before it's, uh, it, it's reaches in its end. I might just say is that, you know, at least the Cubans now under Fidel's brother Raul uh, say that they, they want to downsize uh, uh, the, the, the government-run economy. Um, maybe some of you have seen those reports in the press that in some public address not long ago, Raul Castro uh, said that, the, the, that, that a half a million state employees were, let, were going to be let go and told to get jobs in a, in a new limited private sector in the Cuban economy. I wish our president would say that tomorrow he's letting half a million government employees go. Maybe we need Raul Castro as president of the United States. He sounds pro, more pro-market than Barack Obama. But, uh, um, but, the, but, the, but the problem is, is that it is very difficult once the, the, the stranglehold is here. Um, I, I, I don't know an easy answer to this. Um, we, have, we have time for, I think, two more questions here. Uh, the next one comes from Darren Wolf. It says, one problem is that partial socialization of the economy isn't seen as socialism. For example, education in the roads in the U.S. and oil in Venezuela. How can this lack of perception be dealt with? Uh, it's basically an educational aspect to this. Uh, I'm a university professor. I've been teaching a long time. And very little is known uh, among uh, student age uh, people uh, about the reality, the history, the experience of the Soviet Union. The type of thing that I briefly tried to talk about uh, during this time. Uh, it, it's education to make people aware that, that, that like causes bring about like effects, right? There's causality in the world. And if you bring about the certain institutional changes, it will have the same institutional consequences. And that's what has to be emphasized and brought out, uh, and pe people have to be educated. We see this with health care. I mean, health, national health care in the Soviet Union or in a variety of other countries is, is, is very far from utopian. Yet people have this false impression in the United States, too many of our fellow Americans, well, look at Canada, look at Great Britain, look at France, oh, it's health care, it's good. But the point is, if you talk to Canadians, if you talk to Brits, if you talk to Frenchmen uh, who have experienced health care there and have attempted to look at it with a critical eye, uh, it's far from utopian. So it's basically an educational job. Now, the other problem is, is that the government can, in fact, run various parts of the economy uh, with, with uh, with, with uh, some limited success because a socialized or government managed sector of the economy still operates in a broader market environment and therefore the surrounding market environment can in a sense sort of a cushion and save the government run sector as well as the fact that any inefficiencies that are resulting in, 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 in budgetary deficits in that government sector can be covered by just taxing the remaining private sector. Uh, so it's basically education, education, education. Uh, each of us who believes in liberty uh, has a burden, a necessity, a sense of a conscience of believing that freedom is good and becoming as informed and knowledgeable as our interest and our time permits about the philosophy of freedom, the dangers of its collectivist opposite, and trying to develop means and methods of articulation so that whether it's with our friends, or family members at holiday time around a dinner table, or in the workplace with co-workers, not to be pushy and trying to you know, constantly get people to listen to what you have to say, because people get irritated by that. But whenever opportunities arise, uh, to not to put your own uh, beliefs under a bushel, but to try to share them with your fellow uh, citizens, fellow human beings, uh, a letter to the editor, um, speaking up politely and courtesy in a classroom if you're a student, uh, in which the professor is preventing views and ideas uh, that you think are wrong in this place. Now, let me just add here, that doesn't mean you're going to win. I, I got interested in these ideas with it when I was a teenager. Uh, I thought I knew a lot of these ideas when I got into college. And I wouldn't keep my mouth shut. I argued with my undergraduate professors a lot. In fact, sometimes I'm surprised that I even <laughs> was able to get through their classes since I irritated them so much. And I got shot down a lot. It was obviously the professor has been reading more, he's been going over the same material for semesters, years, you're often not going to win against the professor. But there's no other way than politely and courteously in proper questioning and in class discussion to at least challenge, well, why is this? How do you know this? Is this correct? Isn't there a different way to think about it? Because remember, you're not trying to per persuade your professor. He's set in his mind. 
what you're trying to let your fellow students in the classroom know that at least there is a different way to think about the issues, problems, or topics that have come up in the classroom. It's for the other st students to know this is an alternative to the professor's ideas that you don't that you don't agree with. Okay, and the final okay. question is from Daniel Wilson. And, and he what asked, would Russian socialism have been more productive if they transitioned Marx and Lenin? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the Hello? I'm sorry, you cut out right there. What was that? I, I didn't hear the full question. If you could repeat it, please. Um, the question was, would Russian, uh, Soviet, Russian socialism would have worked better if it transitioned from capitalism like Marx, original, Marx wanted? Well, of course, what Marx believed is that history followed a deterministic path, uh, that you went from primitive society to uh, slave society to feudal society to wage-based uh, market exchange society, capital society, and that there would be a particular transition process of institutional evolution that he detailed to some extent that would go in for, from capitalism to socialism and then socialism to a post-scarcity utopia of communism. Uh, the fact is, is that uh, history doesn't follow a trajectory like this, as if the universe has been wound up like a clock. Uh, it, and, and in fact, it was in the most industrial countries where Marx expected the socialist revolution to occur, Britain, France, the United States, that, that, that full socialist movement never got off the ground. In fact, people, uh, even when they occasionally had a socialist government or a socialist coalition government, never really wanted that full model of socialism like was imposed by dictatorial force in the Soviet Union. In fact, where did it occur? It occurred in backward countries uh, where, where, where elitist uh, uh, political groups could play upon poverty and, uh, and, and real political corruption in the form of aristocracies, or, or privilege for a few at the expense of a, a very much uh, poverty-stricken uh, underprivileged. Uh, so in fact, uh, it, it, you could say, well, you don't try to carry out a revolution. Just sort of let nature follow its course. But the fact is, if nature is allowed to follow its course, you'll never get socialism, because socialism does not naturally occur. It either occurs through a violent revolution by a, by a revolutionary elite, or as Stalin did at the, at the end of the Second World War in Eastern Europe, it's imposed at the point of an army's bayonets. Thanks again, Richard Ebling, for uh, joining us today. I really appreciate it. It was a fantastic presentation. It was absolutely my pleasure. And if any of the listeners uh, want to ask any other questions, uh, they can reach me at my email address at Northwood University. And if I may share that, that's just Ebeling R, that's E-B-E-L-I-N-G-R, at northwood.edu. And I'll be glad to answer any of the questions uh, that I'm able to. Excellent. Thank you. Um, to our listeners out there, next webinar is going to be Wednesday, May 18th. David Friedman will be delivering a talk on anarchy and efficient law. Register at studentsforliberty.org. Um, and we'll also be sending a survey around real soon to evaluate the webinar. Just take a couple of minutes to fill it out. It helps us know what we need to do to improve our programs and how to make these webinars even more interesting for all of you. And with that, we're done. Thank you again, Professor Ebling, and to all of our participants this evening.